not everything in life is what it seems, because even salt looks like sugar. Greetings from the dark side of the pomegranate. I am your host, Billy Hoosh. Welcome to Even Salt Looks Like Sugar, a podcast that explores true crime, paranormal activity, and unsolved mysteries. This series discusses difficult and distressing subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Episode 1, Tanner Barton The suspicious death of a college football player A mother seeking answers silenced A helping hand facing unwarranted resistance Imagine waking up one morning thinking your day is going to be great And in a sudden second All of that changed. This happened to Michelle Barton on April 22, 2012, when she received the sudden news that her son Tanner was dead. Barton received a call hours after her son was found. With so many questions left unanswered, she is still trying to find out what happened on that cold spring night in Kokomo, Indiana. Today I speak with Michelle regarding her son Tanner's death, as well as the discrepancies in the investigation, and why she believes there's something deeply suspicious about his case. Okay, so Michelle, can you tell me about your son Tanner? Tell me about Tanner. Uh, yes. Uh, well, Tanner, he uh, Tanner Lane Barton. He was uh, born July second, uh, nineteen ninety two. Um, he he was always such a good kid. I mean, a wonderful child. He grew up to be an even better, you know, <laughs> young man. Great kid. Um, played sports you know, all through school, um, you know, he was football, um, wrestling, um, track, you name it. He did it. He was in theater. He was, um, in choir. He sang, he played guitar. Um, he just was a a great all around kid. And, um, when he went to college, he actually got a scholarship to play football at Marion university in Indianapolis. And while there, yeah, yeah, he, big old boy good 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 football player really good football player and um while there he actually made the dean's list uh both semesters um he yes uh, yes um we were so proud of him he is you know he was he actually helped other kids he tutored other kids while um playing football and getting his own grades up when he was in physical he was gonna be a physical therapist so um you know those courses aren't easy, and um, he, yeah. And he actually said, um, I remember he goes, he got like a perfect score in chemistry um, his freshman year, and he's like, oh my gosh, mom, this is this class is so boring, I could teach it. And I'm like, <laughs> so um, no offense to his professor whatsoever, um, but he just, he just, he was just a good kid, um, and yeah, just very smart very kind um everybody you know the same you know how everybody says the same thing um, <laughs> about you know a, a person that dies and they do it's like he was you know uh, he lit up a room um you know when he walked in he just he was so 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 he was just funny i mean he i missed that so sorry um yeah. that's okay i miss because he was my because we're both um, very outgoing, even though he was a little more introverted than I was. Um, of course, I guess that would go with his age. 
<laughs> As he got older, like his mom, he would have been a little more, you know, vocal and outgoing. But um, but he was he was just so funny, and and we would play off of that with each other. And um, yeah, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, oh, I'm tr- I didn't mean to do that, but um, that's okay. Yeah, he just a good, just a great kid. Sounds like it. Sounds like he was a. a, a amazing kid um now um i know that this next part is going to be it's going to be difficult um but can can you can you describe to us how did you hear about the loss of your son can you describe that that day yes it was um it was in the morning so it was a sunday morning uh, April 22nd, 2012. Um, it was weird. We, you know, we it, going about my day. I mean, we had just um, had breakfast. I made, you know, BLTs, which is one of Tanner's favorite. Um, he'd gotten home the day before, and he was, we, you know, at, at this point we thought he was still out, you know, at Purdue, where we thought he was going to a friend's a party and he was going to hang out there. Da da da. Um, so, you know, I made extra bacon. You know, I, I made sure I had a bit made a bunch just for him and I you know I put it in the fridge just for him um and I was actually folding his clothes he of course brought home every time he came home 5,000 bags of clothing (laughs) 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 dirty um and I was in the middle of doing his laundry and actually I remember holding his um Marion University. I was holding his Marion University, um, his football shirt, and um, I got a, a phone call, which I thought, well, that's kind of weird. And then I, um, it was Tanner's friend Tommy, um, his best friend um, from high school on, or middle school on up, and you know they still were best friends. And and he says, uh, Michelle, has anybody called you? Have you heard from anybody? And and that's when I knew, you know, something. You know, something's not right. And I said, um, I said, no. I said, Tommy, what's wrong? I said, what is wrong? And he said, um, Michelle, there's there's been an accident, and we think Tanner's dead. And of course, you know, millions of things were going through my through my head. And I kept thinking, oh my God, he was in a car wreck. And I kept thinking, oh my God, he was back and forth from Purdue. And I know 26 um, going back and forth to. Purdue is a really um, bad road, real curvy, and at nighttime it's really hard to see. And I kept thinking, you know, oh my God, he was in a car wreck, or was he? You know, the fifty thousand million things all in one second went through, and he said no. He goes, I don't know. He, my, my dad's on his way out to the Salazars. There's, he died there or something, and and I just kept saying, well, I don't understand what you're you're saying. And he goes, Michelle, something bad happened to Tanner. And of course, I hung up, and then I just started trying to call all my family, and um, you know, and we we finally, you know, we found out all that, and um, we were calling back and forth, trying to, because we didn't know where these people lived. I mean, I know that it was, it wasn't Tommy's house; it was another um, friend's house, and um, and we didn't know where these people lived because um, Tanner had only been hanging out with them for about a year and a half, and it was on the other side of the county. So anyway, so we, that's what we were doing. We, and I contacted my um, neighbor, who is a sheriff deputy. And I said, uh, and I said, oh my God, it's the, it's, I said, so they said Tanner's dad. I said, could you, could you please verify? Could you, could you get some information for us? And he goes, okay, hang on, hang on. So he hung up. And by that time we'd already taken off because we found out where these people lived and we were on the way to that house. And he called me. And I remember exactly where I was when he called in the car. Jeff, my husband, was driving. And he said, he said, oh, honey. He goes, it's true. He said, Tanner died. So we, um, of course, my husband took off as fast as he could to get out there. And, um, yeah, we got there and there was crime scene tape and that whole family. There was like a the family and another person there and they were all lined up outside um later we found out that it was actually a, actually was a crime scene like literally and they didn't believe those people so um that was the morning 
up to that point. What information did you receive um, from the investigators uh, immediately when once you arrived there? Did they start talking to you or giving you any any details of what was going on? Or what was the reaction that you received from the investigators? I know it's probably hard because I know for sure if I was in that situation, I would be an emotional mess and I wouldn't know what was going on. But do you remember what the, the police were saying at that time? Um, yes, actually, um, we pulled up and we got out of the car and started running because it's a, it's a very long driveway. It's like a country home set back and it was a long um, gravel road up to the house. And we could still see those people. I mean, it was, you know, um, but we got there and there was an officer at, at the, at the, he was guarding the driveway. Um, I guess they knew that we were on our way out and we're like, we got to get up there. My son died. And he goes, ma'am, you, and sir, you cannot go past this line. And we're like, what, this tape. And I said, why is my son's up there? Something happened to him. And he kept, and my husband's like, that's our child. And he goes, ma'am, you, I mean, he was rude. Oh my God. It was awful. It was like, you know, get to treat us the way he did. And my husband, we were getting ready to walk up. My husband, he says, don't go up there. And my husband says, what are you going to do? Shoot us? And he goes, I'll do what I got to do. Wow. That was, yeah, that was the first. Because at this point, see, we, we knew it was a crime scene just by the tape. Mm -hmm. um, but in the um, coroner's notes, we found out that it actually was a crime scene. And they called in the detectives. Um, to investigate um, and that's in the coroner's notes um, but after that um, a, a, my neighbor pulled up and um, he he went in and and I, I asked him I said please go in there and make sure nobody does anything to Tanner I said you go in here and you protect him I said you make sure everything's you know and he did he went in and he stayed the whole day with my son who was deceased at the bottom of some stairs um and then another officer, um, deputy, who um, I knew through my neighbor, he pulled up and, um, you know, and he, he just told us, he goes, I don't know what's going on. I just know that um, your son has died. I'm, I'm going to go in there, Michelle. I'm going to find out everything. Um, you just stay here. And then about the time he was going in there, um, we we seen the detectives come through and I go, well, who's that? And he goes, that's the detective. And then, um, not much longer after that, we seen a little red truck and, um, I'll never forget this little red truck. And he said, um, I said, no, who's, who's that? And he goes, Michelle, that's the coroner. And I'm like, I literally lost it. And, those are words you'd never, as a mother, yeah. ever want to hear. Is that's the corner. Um. Anyway, sorry, I'm emotional. I haven't that's okay. talked about this part of it. I, I appreciate you asking these questions. Um, they're, they're I appreciate this. Um, they're just hard to get out. Um, that's it's awesome. very emotional because next week's his eighth anniversary of his death. So this this time of year, I'm extremely emotional. Um, yes. but I'm gonna I'm gonna get through this. <laughs> yeah, I'm working so, on it. Um, you're doing great. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for talking. Oh, yeah. uh, but okay. So, um, then later on, it was after we left and we went back home. Um, the coroner showed up, and um, my neighbor, who's you know a, an officer as well, um, and they he said, he goes, um, he told us he goes that was uh, your your son's death is highly suspicious, and um we are going to we're waiting on autopsy because i think we think that it's going to prove what happened to your son and that um and he he, he said and he, he was a wonderful man i mean he looked at my family and he goes the house is evil the house is evil there's those people are evil and um of course we didn't know anything really you know that hindsight looking back i see it yes the coroner okay. yes the the coroner told us this and then he he prayed with us you know he um he stood in our living room with our whole family and we all 
held hands and he prayed for us. I mean, yeah, yes. I mean, we call him our angel. <laughs> I mean, we really do. He was a great guy. So um, that was that was that day, really, um, pretty much. Aside from you know making the phone calls and um, we had a vigil that night. Um, kids came and it was it was I, at that point I kind of um, you know what I mean. I'm like out of body, yes. if that makes sense. No, that does. I'm there, but I'm not. That does. Uh-huh. So that was the day. Was that the day after? when the coroner came. That was the day of. Yeah, the, the day, day of. of. That, Yes, or the day of, yes, they found Tanner. So that was, it was like six, six something that, that night or something like that, five, six o'clock at night. He okay. showed up. Okay. Um, could you uh, go into details about what the coroner was telling you that, I guess, alerted the red flags on this being a suspicious uh, death? Yes. Um, okay, so we met. It was after the autopsy. Mm-hmm. Um, we met with the the, the detective. Um, they wanted to sit down with all of us because they said they. He goes, I've never seen anything like this, Michelle. He goes, and I can't explain it to you. Um, we need your whole family to come in, and we would like you to sit down with the coroner, the pathologist and myself and we're going to explain some things that we found or didn't find so we we all were in there and we sat down and the detective himself said um in all of our years combined we have never seen a perfectly healthy kid 19 year old kid die for no reason Mm -hmm. and um none and they kept saying he died of positional asphyxia and my sister who is a um she's a homeopathic doctor type thing she does um you know all natural medicine and she kept telling him you have to have something in your system you just don't lay there and suffocate you you just don't lay there and suffocate and um she goes there has to be something in his system that you missed and um now hindsight we see what you know what went on but now we're like we're then we're like we we had no clue they didn't have anything in his system he had a little bit of alcohol a little bit of marijuana and that was it and they said neither one of those killed him so um and that's when he said it was suspicious um then i spoke with the coroner a little bit later um a month later and he said um i I met with him and he goes michelle there were signs of an overdose there was foam in your son's lungs there was foam first off he said there was foam a nemesis, or he called it something. I think I want to say vomitus or nem- nemesis, and not nemesis, vomitus. And I said, you know, I didn't know what it was. And he's had another um, term for it. And he goes, it was in his throat, in his mouth. And I, I said, I, I don't understand what that means. And he goes, Michelle, those are signs of an overdose. He goes, when your body is foaming and foam comes, that's that you're you're overdosing. And he goes, and those were the those that was there. I said, but it's not in his toxicology. I said. So I don't understand. And at this point, I didn't have Tanner's case file. So I didn't know to go through and look. Um, but he said that there were signs of an overdose. And I said, um, that's when he told me somebody did something to your son. It was not of his doing. And then he said, um, he goes, and Michelle, um, he goes, I, well, I told him, what do you think? Um, what do you think happened? And I gave him, of course, I gave him my scenario first. And he says, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. Wow. So that was the, the original, that was the original corner, the one who was there. Um, and I just think his hands were tied because one, he was told to shut his mouth. And two, I believe um, because of the toxicology being, um, you know, um, tampered with. I believe he didn't have, because it, I don't believe he had um, everything he needed, but when you go through his coroner report, I mean, he, he really says some things that we were like, huh, n- not looking back, because once I said I didn't have them when I spoke with him, he even said um, he was told what possibly could have happened to Tanner, but because there's no evidence, he he can't go with that. So basically somebody kept the evidence out of um, you know, 
out of, out of the toxicology reports and all that, he was, I think they were manipulated. I see. D did you have uh, much of a conversation with the investigator or the police that were uh, first in charge of this case? Or were they not communicating much with you? Um, at the beginning, yes, the original detective, um, but he just kept pacifying me, kind of like, um, he told me um, several things. Um, like I said, at the beginning, th they looked into somewhat, they, th the, um, the statements that were given, they, they had taken each one of those family members in separate squad cars mm -hmm. um, because they were not believed. Uh, the, the original detective told me um, that when he walked in, he knew every single one of them had been lying and that they had formulated a story and he wanted to have them separated. So he said um, to get to the police department, we had them in separate cars. And um, and when you read this, when you go through the statements and you watch the audio statements, you could tell this guy just, it was like, I told him, I said, you interviewed these people like somebody had stolen a bicycle. I said, it, the, yeah, I did. <laughs> and it, yeah, I did, Ooh, Lord. Um, and it is when you when you listen and you read, you're like, he could have put pressure on them so many times through that the statements they were giving, you know, through their interviews. Um, and he and I told him that, and he says, "You just watch too much TV. It's nothing like that." And I'm like, you know, no, but it's not like that either. I mean, you know, and um, but he was. I kept begging him. Um, to test for ketamine and he wouldn't do it and I asked him and I asked him out how many times and I asked the coroner and they said well there's no reason to and I said but I'm asking you to and um, I told them because there is a person that was there that night who had been addicted to ketamine and I said and if you see how what ketamine does to people when they overdose I said it's comparable to um, what happened to my son to Tanner I said so please and they said, no, we just, we're just not going to do that. So they, they wouldn't test and retest Tanner's samples for anything. Um, even Spice, my daughter um, said that she had known people to smoke Spice there. And they wouldn't even test for Spice. They, they said, ah, oh, it wouldn't be in there. And I'm like, well, how do you know if you're not going to test? And why, why wouldn't you do it when somebody's asking you and you've had, I mean, several people came forward about a certain person and, um, and they kept bringing up all these things that they knew and they still would not test for it. Wow. So did they, the investigators, they left the case just as uh, that asphyxi asphyxiation that, that did they close the case completely or? No, no, they didn't close it for six years. Um, and then um, no, they left it open. And he, they said that it was an ongoing investigation. And I said, well, it's got to be, for it to be an ongoing investigation, you've got to be investigating. Yes. yes. And um, and they weren't. It, they weren't. I, we even actually went to the prosecutor, and um, um, our family did. Mm -hmm. And we sat down. I didn't. My family did um, because I was here in Texas. So um, they were able to sit down with the prosecutor, and um, and then I was able to speak with the prosecutor and a detective in, uh, in Kokomo at the Kokomo police. And um, he said, there's something there and it needs to be reinvestigated, relooked into da da da. Um, we're going to assign it to um, another detective in, in Howard County Sheriff's department. I said, no, I said, I want it completely out of that agency. I said, when one does it, the other's going to, I mean, they're band of brothers. You're, you, you can't do that. And, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. He goes, well, we're just going to keep it here, right here in, in Howard County. Um, and so what, which it told us that, uh, there's something wrong here if they're going to want to keep it around, you know, their agency. So, um, yeah, so we tried, um, they said, they said that Tanner's heart was slightly enlarged. Um, and which I, it could have been, but looking back, um, I don't see, it definitely was not his heart because the nobody told us that at the beginning. Nobody. They just said his heart was slightly enlarged. And in the in because I've gone back through our notes, um, we had um, 
a family spokesperson there and they took all the notes and everything and they just said that him, the coroner himself said Kenner's heart is not what killed him so but even though they listed it as a possibility they said that's not what killed him well six years later they're trying to close Tanner's case saying his heart was overly enlarged and this and that and I said you know you had my son's heart six years ago in your hands during the autopsy there were no signs of a heart attack no this just slightly enlarged and now they're going to come back and say that you know he died because of his he had a heart arrhythmia yeah six years later that doesn't doesn't add up at all um, no Mm-mm. now what are what are the steps that it's possible to take to have this case reevaluated? Well, um, we, we, we have been trying to get it reopened. Um, we have somebody who has requested the case files. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time Howard County came back with some legal jumbo, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can't do it because of this statute. Because we were wanting the case file. I'm like, no. Once a case is closed, the family members do have access, should have, um, you know, there should be transparency from the beginning anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, But the parents should have access to the case file unless they're hiding something. Mm -hmm. Unless these people are hiding something, there's no reason why they would not want to give us these case files. We have, okay, there's the case files we had from the very beginning. And then there's the latest set of case files where they actually... Um, started actually investigating from 2017 to when they closed Tanner's case, um, April of 2018, is when they really um, started. um, They weren't investigating to find out what happened to Tanner. They were investigating to shut me up. And and I even told the detective that. And, um, you know, it's obvious. It was everything was obvious. Um, But anyway, back to your question. Um, Then um, this person asked for the case files the second time. And they said, um, the detective said, there is no, there is no case files because this was just an investigation, or there is no case because this was just an investigation. If so I'm like, oh, okay, um, pretty, sit down, honey, you better, better sit down because <laughs> I was like, are you serious? I mean, they, they really thought we would believe that. So my thought is either they got rid of all the case files and shredded everything um, so they wouldn't get busted for what they did um, illegally in my son's case, or they just really have no clue. So that's where we're at with that. Um, We're still going to pursue it. Um, We've got enough evidence that it's obvious that somebody tampered with the toxicology. Um, Like I said before, Looking back, had we known what we know now and really was able to study the toxicology reports, um, back then we would have been able to push for something else. But now um, we're just going to have to go to a higher court and petition to have Tanner's case reopened on what we have, which is, um, it, it, it's obvious that, the to- like I said, the toxicology is a huge key here in yeah. Tanner's case. and. It proves that somebody tampered with evidence. There was obstruction of justice. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, things that these people have done. Which is very serious. Yeah, that's very serious. Um, those are very serious charges. Now, from mm-hmm. my from my perspective as an outsider to this case in this situation, I only see these two two options. One is just gross negligence by the investigation that they completely botched what was going on or it seems to be Mm -hmm. a a cover-up for the family possibly that uh was hosting that that party now um i know that it's difficult you can't really talk about these things in detail um but what what do you what do you believe happened to Tanner that night I believe he was given a drug I believe um he went there because okay he got there like um they went to get donuts and he got back 
Um, I know he talked to his girlfriend from 207 to 211. And that's another thing. She was the very last person to ever speak to Tanner alive outside of that home. Mm -hmm. And detectives never questioned her for six years. Wow. Six years. And I kept telling him, call his girlfriend. She would know. Um, They never called her. Now, there were kids who lawyered up whose family members who didn't live at that house, who lawyered them up, and they weren't allowed to talk to authorities. Um, was she one of them? I, I don't know. Um, she talked to me later on, so I don't think it was her, because she told me that um, she was the one who, when she talked to Tanner, she heard all kinds of rambunctiousness going on, and girls were being really loud. Well, in this girl's statement, who was supposedly the only one sitting downstairs with Tanner having drinks, there was nobody else there. Um, She says it was quiet and they were just hanging out. Well, the girl who made the phone, you know, made the phone call to Tanner, his girlfriend, told a whole different story. And I even told the detectives that and they they never questioned her. And, And then later this last, I caught the Hail Mary the Hell Mary investigation that happened in 2018. It was her last attempt. Um, they, um, she lied and said she never said that stuff to me. So, which, you know, is really sad, to be honest. And I want her to know how sad and pathetic that is because Tanner would have never have lied. Tanner did everything to make that girl's life, um, you know, happy and, and help her in any which way. And um, that is a, just a really pathetic thing that she did. Um, cowardly um, but anyways back to the 307 to 2, 207 to 211 the phone call was made and the gal um, the gal that was there her statement the, the young girl said that um, that's when her and Tanner started getting drunk and you know a whole bottle of um, rum had been consumed uh, she said that there was a pineapple juice mixture and Tanner gave her some of that. She had fruity drinks. She had a beer. And this pineapple mixture kind of, you know, really kind of set me into a different pattern. Once we've seen this, this thought process was, you know, people put ketamine in pineapple juice to, um, to, because it's got a funky taste, I guess, um, is what I was told. Actually, a professional who, um, I can't, I'm not going to say her name or what she does, um, but she's the one who said that that's what they do. They put, because they're, they kept mentioning pineapple juice mixture, not a pineapple juice drink or a drink with pineapple juice. They called it the mixture. So um, that kind of threw off red, you know, red flags for us. But um, so they consumed this and then Tanner, Tanner passed out. She said he collapsed and, and died or collapsed and she took his pulse. And she never, she never contacted 911 or, or got an adult. She just left him there. Um, and I believe that, that that they all knew that Tanner had collapsed. I believe that they knew that he had, he was given. Um, I believe that he was given ketamine. Um, just because of the way Tanner did and the way the ketamine, um, you know, how, how people die or overdose on ketamine. Um, you know, you, you, it, it's a horse tranquilizer and you suffocate, you, you can't position your, you can't reposition yourself to breathe. So you suffocate and okay. Hence Tanner, the same thing happened to Tanner. We were told that he suffocated. Um, the coroner told us that it took Tanner, you know, a, two to three hours to die. He slowly died because he couldn't reposition himself to breathe. And I said, and that's why my sister and we kept arguing with them saying, this is impossible. I said, he doesn't have SIDS. I said, it's not like a baby with no neck muscle. I said, this is what that is really. And he said, I know, but that's what happened to him. There's signs of suffocation and there's things that they were able to tell us that, um, you know, with his eyes and all this stuff and that he did suffocate. And I said, you know, so we've been fighting that with them. And I said, uh, that was then, and um, with this original corner. And he's, and then what we believe happened was he was given that drug. He collapsed. Um, they knew it because, you know, they took a picture of how much they drank. Um, I'll tell you that in a minute. Let me get back to that. But we believe that they, the family and members all knew, and they just left him there hoping. And I think they turned his head down because he was vomiting. 
Um, and I think they turned his head down and so he wouldn't um, choke on his vomit. And I think they left him there and he died. I, I, I believe, yes. And the alcohol, you know, Tanner's alcohol was only 0 0.063, which is well below legal limit. And for a guy his size, it's like comparable to two beers. But yet there was so much alcohol consumed um, by the bottle they showed. And if this girl had never drank before, she would have been throwing up um, drinking that much alcohol. I mean, it, and I drink. Okay, I'll be honest. I'll drink. Um, and, I, and I can only do a couple little shots. And, and I, I got to So I couldn't imagine a little girl who's 15 who's never drank before putting away that much rum and not having any effects tells us that there was more people there consuming alcohol that night than so, just two people. So you believe Tanner had a had a spiked drink of ketamine and it wasn't the alcohol, it was the ketamine that he it took away his motor functioning controls. And that's that's how mm -hmm. he, he um and do you, I don't know anything about I don't know anything about toxicology, but uh is there any reason to believe why does ketamine not show up as easy in uh, in toxicology, or do they need to specifically look for that sort of thing for them to find it? Do you know anything? It has about to be yes, yes, I do. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut in. No um, worries. Yes, they do. It has to be specifically. That's why I was asking them to specifically test for ketamine um, because it has to be. It's it, it's like. Um, like when you go to the doctor, um, you get a blood test for your sugar. Well, that blood test isn't going to show 50,000 other things popping up. It, you, you're specifically looking for something. Yeah, um, yeah Tanner's did not, um, it, it had to have been specifically looked for. Um, and they didn't do it. That's why I asked. Um, it takes like six hours to get through, four, four to six hours for ketamine, four hours. For it to go through your system and we believe that's why they took so long to not call 911 um to call 911 is they waited six and a half hours before they called 911 and we believe they did that to make sure that it was out of his system and nobody would get arrested because um the person yeah one of the adults who was there mm -hmm. the night before mm -hmm. called back to the crime scene that morning um lawyered up that morning had overdosed and um actually was addicted to ketamine and had lost his veterinarian license for uh several years seven years something like that um so we know um ketamine runs i mean all those people were involved in veterinarian medicine so it doesn't does, wasn't just some random drug i picked out um and actually um about two months after Tanner had passed, um, somebody in the veter veterinarian field um, contacted me and told me that they believe that that's exactly what happened and gave me specific things. And I took my concern with this person to the sheriff's department and we begged them at this point to test for ketamine and they would not do it. Even with this much information and somebody being there tied in with at one point who had overdosed at their own home due to ketamine they still would not test for it wow now mm -hmm. so is that community a small community that um is it like everyone knows each other the veterinarian knows the sheriff and uh they're <laughs> because that that seems that seems like a like a like a cover-up like they they someone messed up I know in that what you're house. saying yeah um, yeah no the, the the school the northwestern the school community was very close um, it was one of your it was one of your wealthier school communities um, not by any means that we were wealthy by any means but what I'm saying is there was a lot of money at that school um, a lot of the kids that were that went there their parents were like in the political parts of you know Kokomo and um, is it a on gated the community wars. Is it I'm sorry. Community? Is it a gated community? Was that house in a... No. 
Oh, this one, no, but it was it was a nice big log cabin. Um, but um, it's the Northwestern High School area. Um, but then we went to Kokomo. Kokomo is about sixty thousand people. Um, okay. My thought is that there was one one officer who everybody was close with, um, and he used to be at that school, and he's very good friends with that family and with um, Tanner's girlfriend's family and is he connected um i don't know i i have my i have a lot of red flags have gone off with the officer was he there no uh, no no okay. uh, no i don't i don't know i i looked on the um login sheet no i did not see him but this is just um my own personal opinion don't want anybody to come after me my own personal opinion i believe this officer um I believe this officer protected them. I believe this officer, because out of the blue, um, there was a urine test um, taken, supposedly. They couldn't get urine. I have I have all the tuck the coroner's reports and everything. They couldn't get urine from my son. But all of a sudden, um, during the autopsy, there was a urine test allegedly taken and um, tested for that tested for all the heavy drugs, you know, um, marijuana included. So, and we know Tanner had marijuana in his system per the um, AIT forensic lab. But on this one particular urine, which, okay, when you go to get a job, and it's a job interview, um, th- they screen you for, you know, your urine, and you take a urine test, and th- there's a list of drugs that come up, marijuana being one of them. It's going to show up. No matter how many months ago you smoked it, you know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That was the test they'd use. Well, here's, you have a urine test coming out of um, an autopsy, but yet it doesn't show positive for marijuana. Yeah. Something now imagine that. that. Now where's that urine? Yes. And this doctor, in a cease and desist, I was on the Nancy Grace show. And in a cease and desist to Nancy Grace, he, his lawyer even put that unbeknownst to um, the Barton family or unbeknownst to you, Howard County Sheriff's Department conducted their own independent test and ketamine proved it proved to be negative or whatever. And I'm like, huh, is this their own independent test? That urine, that urine sample that showed negative for marijuana? And, um, because even in the coroner's notes, and I have those, I have that part, thank goodness. He even says it, you know, there was n- nothing. And there was only, the only test that he was able to get was blood and v- vitreous, the blood and vitreous. Um, vitreous is from your eye. Um, that's the most, um, that's the most accurate. And so those were the only two substances or the samples that they could use. Never once did he mention urine, but all of a sudden there's a urine test. So we believe Somebody in the sheriff's department was able to slip that test in and make it appear as though all the drugs had been tested for. Wow. That mm-hmm. sounds like a... A cover-up. A cover-up, uh, yeah. You name it. Yeah. Corruption, obstruction of justice, tampering with evidence. You name it. That's what we believe. So, you know, we're sitting on all this and... Um, it, it, it just it just has to get reopened. It's so obvious at this point. Um, and, and you know, and I'm, I was really mad that this case got closed in 2018. Um, I, now looking back, that was one of the best things that kind of not the best. It was a good thing it happened because so much more information came out um, that we had learned that we didn't know. So um, how did that? Yeah, happen? we we just there's a lot. Uh, because the detective started actually talking to me. I hadn't talked to him in a couple of years. Um, and we had a, a gal who did a three-part podcast series, um, did a wonderful job. I swear she's the one who actually um, solved Tanner's death. And there was another gal who um, works with a cold case group. Um, she was in Colorado. Between those two people, the best um, did the best job ever. And I believe that those... Um, 
Anyway, I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but those two were the ones who solved it. And, and, and she started getting the detectives to talk. And he started saying things. And, and it was funny because, you know, they kept saying it's an ongoing investigation. But when we'd ask him a question, he had no clue. He literally said... And see, here's where the urine thing comes into play. And that's why, looking back, I'm like, huh, you really, this really does make sense now why there's a urine test all of a sudden, or results all of a sudden in there. Because we asked him, um, where's the, did, did they get any urine from Tanner? How, how, where was the urine taken? And he, this is, I swear this was his actual response. They got it from the crime scene. And I'm like, I said, well, what did my son do? Stand up and pee in a cup for you? I said, (laughs) how did you get urine from a crime scene? You can't, like, cut somebody open and take urine from their, you know, kidneys and bladder. You can't deliver. You can't do that. I said, and the other thing, my son didn't stand up and pee for you. So how did you get urine? Oh, hang on. I got to get back with you. I got to get back with you. Well, then we finally, yeah. Yeah, this is the, this is yokel local, okay? Do you, do you see where I'm like so frustrated? And I, I mean, even I'm smart enough to know that this is a detective. So then he got back. He goes, "Oh, oh, oh I was wrong. I was wrong. They couldn't get any urine from Tanner at all." I said, "So they couldn't get any urine at all from Tanner?" Oh no, no, not at all. Not nope. There was none to be taken. I said, "Huh. All right, good to know." So here we have a toxicology report with urine sample in it that they that the detective himself said they could not get from Tanner. Now, who do you think wow. told him they couldn't get? Mhm. Oh, we caught him in a lot of lies. We caught him in a lot of lies. A lot of them and he didn't know and he kept saying I have no but then he was so during when they closed Tanner's case, he was like, "Oh, you know, this has been an ongoing investigation." Michelle's lied to people, this, this, and that. And I'm like, really? You know, <laughs> I've just been asking questions. You, huh? They're trying to discredit Oh, they did. Yeah. Oh, they you. did. And it was awful. What they said about me, um, it was awful. I mean, it was awful. I, I, and I, I, I didn't read everything. I was told to stay off social media when they did close Tanner's case. Um, you know, the national media got involved. Um, Nancy Grace's people made a horrible... They made, they put out such a horrible article saying that I lied and that, that ketamine had been tested for and that I had lied to everybody. Um, you know, back at the beginning, I knew about it back in the beginning. And I'm like, if I knew about ketamine being tested for back in the beginning, you know, I, <laughs> I would have said, okay, great. Okay, now let's mark that one off the, the, the chart. Or I would have said, you know, something. But I didn't lie about I would never lie, for one, about my son's case because that's not going to get you anywhere. It's getting you... What would that prove? What would that help me? You know what I mean? I don't don't know how that would help, but they had to make up some lie. So because they were all going to get sued, I I was told that um, Dr. Oz lawyered up, Nancy Grace lawyered up, a couple other people that were on Dr. Um, Oz's show lawyered up, people from Nancy Grace show lawyered up. Um, and we know that this this doctor had already sent a cease and desist to Nancy Grace one time. Um, so that's why we never did part two of the Nancy Grace show. But then I was told that um, they all lawyered up um, because I lied. And I'm like, well, then you show me where I lied. And um, they said, well, you said that that they had tested for it. And I said, no. I said, if Howard County said they tested for it, I said, for one, I said, this is a black and white. This is not black and white. This is a gray question. You you can't just tell me to say yes or no. And um, they, they were just fishing. They were fishing because they had to they had to throw me under the bus so they wouldn't get sued. Is what my personal opinion. And um, so uh, yeah, you got to throw that in there. Um, so uh, you know, I'm I'm like I I didn't say any of that. I just said. I said, if Howard County said that they tested for ketamine, then I have to say, yes, they tested for ketamine. I said, but they didn't, and they didn't test for ketamine. They said it would have shown up in the toxicology. And I said, and 
Nancy Grace herself and her group of people said, no, it has to be specifically tested for. But see, they didn't put all that in, in the article. They just said that Michelle Barton said that, yes, Howard County did test for it. They're trying to cover themselves. Good old media. Yeah. Yeah. So do you see how I got thrown under the bus and now it turned out to be this big Michelle Barton's this horrible person and then Dr. Oz people um, put out a big press release on social media which had some had several lies in it and you know it was awful for one but told a bunch of lies about what was in Tanner's cell phone and they themselves had my son's cell phone and they should have known you can't put that stuff out there it was all lies well, that was on the 23rd of April, the day after my son's um, six-year death anniversary. How, how, how great is that, huh? Oh, yeah, what kind of people what kind of people do this stuff, you know, to grieving families? Um, yeah, and it was the actual day. So the sixth year was actually, you know, the, that Sunday was actually the 22nd, if, you know what I mean? The, the, so that was even worse. And we had a lot of stuff going on then, and it was even worse. So, um, yeah, so that was the 23rd it was put out. On the 24th, we got in, We made sure we contacted the detective, and we said, is Tanner's case still open? And he said, yes, it is still an open investigation. So these people that worked with Howard County to get Tanner's case closed put this stuff out while Tanner's case was still open. Now, when they put that out, You'll never guess who the first person was who liked, or the second person, to like that fake information that was put out on social media. The detective. The the lead detective, yes. He went on there and liked what that Dr. Oz's people put out on social media. And it had lies in it, and Tanner's case was open. So... We, our people, sent a letter to his boss, to the prosecutor, blah, blah, blah. Within 30 minutes, he was calling me. Hey, Michelle, I just wanted to see how you were doing. See if you're okay. I'm okay. Well, I'm driving in Dallas, Texas traffic, so I can't talk. So, you know what I mean? I, I just, I didn't listen because I was on my way to physical therapy. I'd broken some toes, da, 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 da. He contacted me all day. This was on like the 25th or 6th. And contacted me, contacted me. And, and I was like in therapy and I was like in, in a pool and I couldn't get to my phone. And finally he said, well, I've got to go to class. Um, I won't be able to text you. I won't be able to get to you. i got to be in class. I didn't bother him. He kept contacting me, contacting my sister, my husband, trying to get to me. Well, what it was was he knew he had his fingers caught in the cookie jar and he was in trouble. So... Then the last email, he was emailing me up till midnight at night. And I just ignored him because at that point I knew he was not for Tanner. He was part of the cover up and he was part of getting Tanner's case closed. And he was part of working with those people to shut me up. And um, so anyways, they closed. He says, well, we come to a a decision and a conclusion on Tanner's case. And we're just letting you know that we're going to close his case now. So they closed his case on a ridiculous theory that had no no um, forensic evidence whatsoever. No, nothing. They said Tanner had taken Adderall three days before he died and it caused his heart to go into such an arrhythmia that three days later he died from it. <laughs> and for one, there was no Adderall in my son's system. Two, there was no signs of any heart Um, you know, your enzymes that would show a heart-related incident. Three, he never complained. He went to football practice in an arrhythmia. If your heart is out of whack that bad that three days later you die from it, you don't think you're not going to notice or tell somebody? Yeah. Yeah, especially with a high, playing a high-impact sport, I think you would be able to tell, right? Yes. And, and, And he was at my sister's house the night that they said he took Adderall. Um, there was no pictures, there was no evidence, just a text in his cell phone that said he had taken some Adderall to stay up to do a paper with my sister. Well, my sister said, uh-uh. She said, that's not, that's, I, I never seen that. And we had my son's phone and so did my husband. And the detective said, well, 
it may have Tanner may have deleted it that night. And I said, why would he delete that? It's not going to get him in trouble. Why wouldn't he delete something else? I said, why would he delete something that's not going to get him in trouble? But yet he left a few other things about Adderall on there. I said, that makes no sense. He said, well, it probably pulled up in the in, um, when the FBI had Tanner's phone. They pulled it up. It probably pulled up then. I said, no, it didn't. I said, no, it didn't. I said, because that wasn't in there. It was planted in there. I said, it's obvious what has happened. And, of course, he, you know, he blah, 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 Michelle. And uh, my sister even told him, no, I know my nephew. I, she goes, I, he's like my child. She goes, I never seen him act any differently that night. And if you don't have to take Adderall, it makes you hyper. And my son's so laid back. And my sister said, Michelle, he was so calm. He was the same old Tanner. She said there was no way he took Adderall that night. But the detective didn't want to hear that. Michelle, you were so, talking about, you've been getting a lot of resistance about um, in t- towards uh, Tanner's case, whether that be from Nancy Grace or Dr. Oz. However, um, I heard that you were getting some people are attacking you or uh, basically coming after you on social media is that true oh yes it is it has been um it's been crazy um actually i it started um the back in it actually started after march of 2018 um it's been two years now um it started march around march going on into the last couple years i've had um some pretty bad people um, come on and pretend they're somebody. I've been catfished. I've been, I'm being cyber stalked. Um, I've actually gone to the FBI twice. Um, I've gone to the police um, several times. We've worked, um, I've had to work my way up through the system in the police department. Uh, they all see it, but there's things that they can't do until certain things, you know, these people do certain things. They gotta cross a certain line before um, the police will get involved. Um, I was told by the FBI that he does see signs of criminal activity, but like I said, there's things that they can't do anything until um, they cross a certain line. Um, I've had people impersonating me, getting kicked, have, pretending they're me getting kicked off of social media. I've been people calling my son um, fat, obese, with a short neck, that's why he died. Uh, victim blaming him I, I mean phone calls that I mean my phone's been hacked my computer hacked um, it's been awful to be honest it's been um, it just horrible the things they've done and hate website I've had illegal charges filed against me for things I've said on Facebook that have that you know an attorney has told us absolutely that has that was your first amendment right being um violated um now are these people just trying to silence you or who who because it seems to be ever since the case was closed they started to crop up or why yeah why are they doing this why do you believe that they're what's going on okay in my personal opinion Mm -hmm. um tanner's phone held a lot of um was was going to be a big um breaking news moment and when somebody else went on a national show in um, Canada and mentioned my son's phone first, mm-hmm. um, that's when these people, when a lot of people turned on me. Um, and because I didn't apologize, because I did nothing wrong, I didn't know. I, I was just excited that my son's case, somebody in Canada was, you know, he was on the morning show in Canada. I mean, there was my son's picture. You know what I mean? I just, mm-hmm. that's my, I was just excited that there's, other people that are wanting to look into my son's case and the more the people looking the more um the more chance of somebody coming in and saying hey we want to take and do an an exhume him Uh, you know because it's it's expensive to exhume and that's what we were wanting is somebody to come in and really step in and help us with their um you know their uh, expert you know expertise of doing this stuff and that's what we were excited about but we didn't realize that the people there are other people that um wanted just exclusive and 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 to be exclusive in tanner's case and you know get the the recognition for it well i didn't know that i mean i didn't sign anything that said it was exclusive um 
but it was then um, I had a couple people close their um, reviews um, the Dr. Oz show one of them um, that, it was after that it, the, air, the show aired and once that show aired um, it was about a month later um, that Canadian show went um, aired and then it was three days later I, I was told I took food off of someone's table. I was, you know, horrible things were said. And it, people were mad at me. And that's when it all started. Um, you know, I I didn't know. It, it wasn't about who's getting what to me. I could care less. And I, it, to me, it was just I wanted my son's story out there to where, like I said, we could get people to help us. And um, I guess that's not what everybody's intentions really are when you get to that national media um, level, I, I, I didn't know. So yeah, it was then when it started and it got really bad, like really bad. And then um, that's when the breaking news moments came out and um, you know, they did stories about me and, and, and Howard County Sheriff's Department actually um, thanked this person in, in, in their um, press release for helping them close Tanner's case. He thanked them. This is the same person who said horrible things or said lies in Tanner's case, and he was the first one to like the lies. I mean, you see where I'm saying the connection? Yeah. Just It, it was yeah. definitely, they all worked together to shut me up. It was all a master plan to shut me up. They didn't care about Tanner's case. None of them did. Or they would have actually worked Tanner's case. They worked harder at shutting me up than they did it trying to find out what happened to Tanner. So yeah, that's when it started and it has been ongoing for two years now. And, you know, they manipulate the um, internet to where all these things come out. Um, you know, I had um, a protective order. I was, okay, and I want this to be known if, if I can. I, I was stalked for four years um, by a horrible man. Um, and he actually went to jail for a year. Well, he got a year sentence, but you know how that goes. First time offender. Um, and it was horrible. And um, he eventually, after he got off probation, he started in again. I thought he would, you know, leave me alone, but he went and filed false charges. And then he had a cousin file false charges. Um, you know, that's what he that's what he did. Um, and I was in the middle. I got rid of one. The cousin, you know, we, we got rid of that that lunatic. Then this next guy, we were in the middle of, um, he was playing the system, getting judges, da 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 you know, doing that thing. Um, and then Tanner died. I was in the middle of getting that one, you know, going to court with that one. And Tanner died, and Tanner was going to be one of the witnesses, uh, you know, on top of that, because, you know, I was with my son when all this stuff was being said about me, you know, kicking over people's stuff in Indianapolis, da 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 I didn't do that. Um, so... Um, my attorney said, Michelle, just don't. You are not in the frame of mind. And when I finally got to the frame of mind, um, because this guy, you know, got the, the two-year PO, I said, let me let me go back to court. I said, I want this off my, I want this off of me. I want this creep gone. And my attorney's like, Michelle, just leave it alone. You're not in the frame of mind still. You're moving to Texas. Just go. It won't stay on your your record. I'm like, and I believed him. And of course, it's still on my record. And um, so then. The next one was the um, veterinarian who lawyered up that morning. There was there was a website that was put out, and it just had his name. It had everybody who was there that day. It was listed. Nothing big. It was just a, you know, we're promoting Tanner's march. We're getting ready to do a big march. Well, um, I didn't know, but he filed false. When he, he we went to have the website taken down, he tried to get it taken down. It was denied um, through Google or GoDaddy, whichever one it was. And um, we had it taken, it did, he tried to get it taken down, it couldn't, they wouldn't, they denied him. Two days later, he went into the courts and filed false charges against me, saying I was stalking him and threatening him, um, saying horrible things to him, but uh, um, I never received any information, no court date, nothing, there was no PO, nothing sent to me in Texas. When I got back for the march, um, in October of 2015, I got back to the march. Um, the, the the sheriff, we t we were talking to him the day before the march. He goes, "Well, you've got a protective order here, Michelle." Um, I said, "Let me guess." 
the only person here who would want to shut me up would be would be the veterinarian. And he said, yep. I said, well, serve me. So they came out. We had it on video. There was no court date. There was nothing. This guy, um, it was just a, a temporary, just to, because I was coming back to town. He just wanted, he tried to shut the, the march down is what it was. And the um, serving officer said, just stay away from him. Just go your way. He's, I said, I'm, I'm away. I said, I have no reason to be here for that person. Um, and it was the close on the 26th. I went to the court. There was no court date, nothing. I went back home. Five days later, I get something in the mail saying that I missed a court date, and he got a two-year PO on me. So I didn't stalk him. He stalked me through the system. He was able to use the system and somebody in the system to keep things out of the system so he could get a protective order against me. Because even I have an affidavit from that officer who swore, you and he every which way he could write it, that I did not know about a court date and that he did not have it in his possession to serve me at all. He had none. And um, anyway, so we tried to fight that. Of course, you can't fight against something when the judges, you know, the courts are dirty. Um, and then I recently, because I spoke out against um, people, um, they were able to use a, a judge friend um, and have charges filed against me after they were stalked. In, um, well, I, allegedly, because my all my stuff shows, um, IP addresses show that people were um, from an area that were in my in my um, in my phone um, a month before I had fake charges filed against me in Atlanta. So, I, I, you know, I don't stalk people. I'm not a stalker. I'm just people people who are guilty or people who um, you stand up to. Some people don't. They don't. Have, they can use the system, and that's what these people did. It sounds I like swear, it. my husband laughs because he's like, because they say I'm stalking them and, and that I'm hacked into all their stuff. And that, and my husband laughs because he calls me, come on, IT brain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because he laughs because he's like, do they not know that you are the dingiest person that you can't even turn on the dang TV? And uh, we laugh. I laugh. I told him, I said, guess what, Jess? I said, they said that I'm an internet genius. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, I am hacked and stalked. And he, he laughs. He still calls me this. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I'm not a stalker. So they have it out there. So they've got com the computer, the internet um, stacked up or whatever you call it to where when you Google my name, it shows all this stuff where I'm a stalker and a hacker. Um, for one, I'd like to know how they were able to obtain court records because um, these are sealed records in family court. So how were they able to get these legal documents and put them out on the internet for malicious intent? Yeah. And because we even tried, I had somebody try um, purposely to see if they could get them and they said, nope. All, uh, both, both um, courts um, in in uh, Atlanta and here in 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 it, well, back in Indiana, and they said they they were sealed. The only people that can get them are the um, the two people involved, and um, and but they're out there. I mean, it's out there, I, and you know, that's what they do to me. I mean, this is the kind of stuff I've had to go through. These people discrediting you and building like a paper trail to just make you look bad mm -hmm. Michelle what can people who are listening to this what can they do to um, support reopening the case or if they want more information or or to reach out what what um, I guess social networks do you have uh, for people to come and support you um, y yes um they can go to at Tanner's voice, um, at justice for Tanner with a four at justice for, um, number four Tanner. That's my Twitter handle. Um, there is Tanner's voice, which is on Facebook. Um, they can even come to me at Michelle Barton. Um, that is my Facebook page. Uh, that's about right now. Um, it that I trust, um, you can't go to Howard County. 
really, they're not going to, we've already had people go and um, try to give tips and they don't take them. Um, and I do not use email anymore because my emails are all completely hacked. So I've, I've had to just get a, an email address that um, I only use for legal purposes. So I don't give that out. Um, so that's about it at this point. Um, but it just reach out to me. If you have any way of helping um, with anything that I've talked about today, I would really appreciate it. Um, really appreciate it because, you know, I'm under attack. <laughs> I, I really am under attack. Not only am I trying to get my son's case reopened, but the attacks to um, discredit me, you know, it's, it's, it's actually sickening, to be honest. It's actually pretty scary and sickening that there are people out there that can do this and you know we just we could use any help that we could get to um get things rolling for tanner um is there anything else you want to add or anything you want to uh, put out there i just uh, yeah i just i just want people to know that you know I, we're all we want is answers for tanner's case we just want to know the truth about the night Tanner died. I, I'll, I'll need all this other stuff. I, I just want to know what happened to Tanner so we, our family, can have some, we'll never have peace. That is something we'll never have. But just peace of mind knowing that we don't have to now go and spend all these hours just searching for answers. When, when the truth is sitting there and these people who were allegedly and supposedly Tanner's friends know exactly what happened to Tanner. They, they, they know exactly what happened that night and they chose to, um, they, they just chose to, as a pact, shut their mouths and keep quiet. But I just want people to know if there's somebody there telling you not to talk and they've threatened you or scared you into not talking, that, you know, there are places you can go to talk and tell this, um, you know, give an anonymous tip. Go to the FBI. Go to Indiana State Police. Stay out of Howard County. Contact them. Tell them that you have tips. Um, and and do the right thing. I mean, just, just man up and do the right thing and tell the truth. My next interview is with Sarah Afshar, who has been reporting on Tanner's case through her own independent investigation. Both Sarah and Michelle have been experiencing cyber stalking and slander ever since they began questioning Tanner's suspicious death. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can, how are you? Perfect, I'm doing wonderful, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, so, can you tell me how you got involved with, uh, Tanner's case? Sure. Um, actually, a friend of Morgan Ingram's contacted me and said, you should interview this woman. Her name's Michelle Barton, and her son died of a highly suspicious death. And I thought it was really interesting. I didn't hear anything about the case at all until it was brought to my attention. Then Mrs. Barton, Michelle, added me on Facebook and we became friends and I was able to get more familiar with the case and um, she sent me some stuff and I did my own independent investigation because I was kind of looking to know the case fully rather than uh, one dimensionally and I discovered so many discrepancies in this case that play into the foul play narrative. Now, um, Michelle was informing uh, us that she's been uh, experiencing a lot of resistance um, from voicing her opinion and talking about the case. Um, did you experience similar uh, people like cyber stalking you? And, and um, there's she was uh, saying that she was getting hacked on social media. Um, I was mm -hmm. wondering, were you getting having this experience as well? Absolutely. Um, it was kind of uh, distressing and disturbing at first. It started back um, 
because I never dipped into the realm of true crime until 2012. That's when I first got involved. Um, it was with the case of Morgan Ingram. I interviewed Tony, and I didn't even publish the interview yet. And these people just came onto my page threatening me and actually saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, to, to ruin your life. And they actually told me, like, it was almost like a warning that they were going to, like, do something. And I, I didn't think anything of it. I kind of just brushed it off. But then over the years, um, they really proved their words true by, by lying about me, um, also threatening me, impersonating me, going to people's pages, harassing me, saying crazy stuff about me that's not even true under my own identity, like just crazy outlandish, outrageous stuff. And it was horrible. It was so horrible. Um, I think they even, <laughs> they even said, like, the, I mean, some of this stuff is just so unsettling so disturbing I really don't even know how I can put it into words how to describe everything but I still like remember seeing this stuff because I was never a victim of cyberbullying until the Morgan Ingram thing now that I'm supporting Michelle I've received um, similar backlash actually and people um, trying to report my blog as well as libel me and um, spread defamation as well so who do you believe um, are these people and what, are the, what is their motivation to, um, they're trying to silence you or what, why do you believe that they're doing this and they've been so persistent for so many years? Because they do not want anyone disagreeing with them. Yes, silencing, they have tried to silence me in the process, but they also disagree with my narrative, my theories, and they don't want anyone else disagreeing with them so they basically want to perpetuate anyone being something something like repulsive whether it's a monster a stalker etc etc you know they they want to devalue people and silence them and make make others turn against them and you, sorry i'll go ahead do you oh, believe these people are directly involved with these cases or they're just um these true crime rabid fans or something li like that who who do you believe are these uh these people doing this um mostly a mixture of both but usually the true crime um fanatics and enthusiasts a lot of them become super super obsessed with cases sometimes they don't even leave their house they try to you know create things in their minds that they know the theories and if anyone thinks differently or goes against what they believe, you know, bam, they want to do whatever they can to silence that person, intimidate them, harass them, use any kind of means of slanderous um, anything, you know, spread false accusations, create these false like allegations to, like I said, to devalue you in your opinion so people won't believe you or believe that opinion. So these are like crazy bored people that are trying to be <laughs> detectives and stuff. I know we've seen this before on Reddit where um, Reddit posters would try to solve these um, ongoing investigations and they would be way off and end up uh, slandering the wrong person and causing causing uh, heartbreak and harassment and stuff like that. So it's similar to that case. It's just like internet trolls. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's very similar. In fact, I've been known to hear that the people that have been harassing me are regular um, users on Reddit, on the Reddit platform, in the true crime groups and, and threads and subthreads, etc. So it, yeah, I definitely think too, when you dip into this realm, it's almost inevitable to avoid. You can't really avoid this because there's going to be people that disagree with you but mm -hmm. they don't have to go to this length. Um, they have spread horrible untrue lies about me. There, there's been some that have been so outrageous and disturbing. Um, they said I was harassing a, a guy from Oregon who, um, you know, basically this, this person's like a habitual liar. They said that I was harassing him and he was homeless because of me or something or something that was posted about him and it was connected to me and I never even spoke to this man in my life, mind you. And it was just so disturbing to hear that people are actually believing this person. 
and this person like devalues me like I, and I'm thinking what the heck is going on I never even spoke to this person in my life and to continue the whole like you know the whole charade they they try to perpetuate this narrative that I go after anyone who disagrees with me almost like you know they're trying to like silence me and and trying to devalue me in a sense where other people will you know agree with them or, or you know believe them and be like wow this person is a bad person and it's all because they disagree with what I have to say on a crime case do, do these people stay anonymous or do they uh, use their real names when they go about to uh, slander and harass you? They have used a mixture of both. Like they have used, and they also use stolen identities as well. Um, one woman in particular, she's from Oregon. She basically uses multiple aliases and she uses her full name as well. And then there's one woman from uh, Utah who owns a true crime forum who also um, does the same exact thing like these women they are pretty much true crime trolls and they'll go they'll do whatever they can to make people believe them and you know believe their narratives basically um can you explain to me in a nutshell what is what is true crime um is is it a form of maybe yellow journalism or what exactly is it that attracts uh these type of folk well true crime is the reality of the world in a sense where it's the darkness of the world pretty much all the darkness that you see is it stems around this genre the subculture you know a lot of people think oh true crimes just murders and stuff it's more than that it's murder mysteries it's stalking it's zero stalking it's death you know, it, a lot of it stems, though, with um, people that have, like, severe mental disorders or people that are actually borderline evil and satanic. Um, basically, true crime is that subculture that, that basically introduces you. It's a mystery, and it introduces you to the darkness of the world. Are they all unsolved mysteries? Not always. Some are solved. Some are unsolved, of course. Um, a lot of them are just you know, shedding light on a murder case that's like ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it's a lot of scandalous stuff and speculation. Some of them are though, I mean, it's really interesting because some of them are not solved. And then people try to kind of, you know, decide who is the perpetrator, who's the person who, you know, stalked and killed who and such and such, et cetera, et cetera. I see. So it can be a form of entertainment as well as a form of advocacy for um, people that are trying to get justice for uh, a situation. It is. Um, it used to not be, but ever since Unsolved Mysteries, that pretty much was like the first show that kind of, you know, dipped into this realm. And then later on, people were kind of like joining forces. And then with the internet, of course, you know, the internet today, there's so many different, um, you know, platforms that kind of entertain this, and it's become an entertainment platform these days in 2020. Yeah, no, I've seen, you know what, I've even been on public transit and seen uh, billboards for uh, true crime podcasts that it was, it was unbelievable how big it is. Um, I guess it's always been in the background, but it seems to be now f the forefront of popular culture. A lot of people are into this um, what would you call it? A genre? Would you call it a, uh, a subculture? Or it's a little bit of both, actually. It's it's a genre in a sense where you know people it's it's so separate, mm -hmm. but they kind of call it like you know a subculture these days because it's put into a group. Mm -hmm. You know, um, true crime though these days should be a genre within itself. I mean, it's made up with so many different things: missing cases, missing persons. You yeah. know, um, ongoing cases, bizarre deaths. You know, there's so many things that, that intertwine and kind of, you know, coordinate with each other and combine. And it just, it's it's the darkness of the world as we see it. And it's like real, it's, it's true crime. <laughs> no, for sure. And yeah, you did express that it's uh, a quite quite a broad uh, a topic that there's many facets to it. Um, it's really interesting. For you entering this world of true crime, uh, you've experienced a lot of like negative effects from it. 
do you have any regrets of um, of how you've approached this? You know, whenever I first started this, I kind of like was scared about it because I'm like, oh my god, what if these people like have this plan that they're gonna try and portray me as like a monster who can't take criticism or, or can't handle other people's opinions on a, a certain case, especially in the case of like Morgan Ingram or Tanner Barton. And um, the reality is like, I can handle criticism. Everything they said was a lie, but I'm thinking what if they're like setting this up so they can like attack me offline and harm me? I mean, I, I never really like looked at it. And at first I was upset because I've never been cyber bullied before. So when I saw the hate sites about me, um, the one on Google, especially, I was very upset about it. Um, but then I had a pep talk with my mom. My mom was working one day and, and I called her up, you know, and I was super upset. And she, she says, Sarah, you're a strong, courageous woman. You're not going to give up. Mm -hmm. You're not the daughter. Like she, she basically said, you wouldn't be the daughter that I believed in. And she, she just basically gave me this really good, courageous pep talk. And you know, I'm super close with my mom. She's one of my best friends. She's a wonderful soul. And she, she basically like admired my work and she admired that I was being like the force, the face and the voice for these victims. So that's whenever I realized, wait a minute, I'm doing the right thing here. I'm doing something exceptional for somebody and I'm believing it. And that's the power. The power of the voice is so phenomenal. So that's whenever I realized you know, throughout the years, you know, I can't be silenced because that would be like, you know, betraying these victims that deserve to be heard. Well, yeah, that's very honorable that you, you stand your Thank ground you. and you don't Thank let them you. push you around and uh, you stick to your word, you stick to your guns. Um, and I think that's something uh, a requirement if you uh, want to go into something like this. Um, Yes, could you uh, explain a more about your uh, your involvement with the Tony Ingram uh, case? Oh, sure. Um, I first spoke with Mrs. Ingram back in 2012. It was around fall, I want to say. And, um, you know, she, she basically said she wasn't going to do too many other interviews because, you know, a lot of people have kind of like, you know, they tried to interview her and then they kind of spun things around acting like she was crazy with Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which they tend to say this about women who just want answers about their child's death. You know, that seems to be one thing I noticed a lot of these true crime trolls do. They, they play these psychologists and they try to, you know, form this diagnosis when they don't have the credentials to do so. And I thought that was really strange, but going back on topic, um, I connected with Tony Ingram throughout the years and I interviewed her for Yahoo Voices mm -hmm. and the interview was super successful. It was republished on Yahoo News. Um, and before I even talked about the interview or before the interview was published, mind you, um, it was actually, uh, you know, I posted on my blog about it and that's whenever I was introduced to some of the biggest true crime trolls that have harassed me still to this day. And, um, you know, that was basically the backlash with that. Uh, speaking of um, the reasons why I believe Morgan Ingram was murdered, there's so many reasons why I believe she's a victim of murder and foul play. You know, she was a stalking victim. She identified the man. Of course, you can't just go and accuse somebody, but she did happen to have a lot of amitriptyline in her bloodstream. Now, she did have some, she did have a lot in her stomach, but obviously, you know, even if she swallowed the entire pill bottle, you know, the amount in her blood is really what makes me believe it was definitely an evident murder. And um, she had 7,909 nanograms, I do believe, in her bloodstream. And I do believe anywhere from uh, 500 to 1,000 is actually the lethal dose of that. So she had over like 6,000 nanograms of amitriptyline in her bloodstream so to me that totally I was like wow that's such a red flag I can't believe I, nobody noticed this I mean I just was like so in shock and then there are a bunch of other things and a lot of people were saying oh you're just parroting what um, people are, are Tony Ingram saying and all this other stuff 
but that's not the case. I did my own independent research on this and there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't add up to me. And I feel like, you know, this woman, this young woman from Colorado that was murdered, you know, she's being extremely um, victim blamed for her own death. And people are trying to paint this uh, narr narrative that she's crazy, that she wasn't a stalk, you know, stalking victim and that they're trying to attack her mother, Tony, and say that Tony drove her to like suicide. And I just felt that that was just disgusting. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's all this proof, you know, that she was murdered, like right in front of our faces. And these people, like they try to create this like distraction that just doesn't make sense to me. So can you tell us what's the most up to date on um, the Ingram case and the Barton case? Where are they at right now? Well, the Ingram case, there isn't much that's going on. The case is closed. Um, Tony has been a wonderful advocate for the cause. Tony and Steve Ingram, they've been doing great. But, um, you know, evidently, you know, they're trying their best to get the case reopened, but they haven't had luck. And I'm hoping in the near future they will. In regards to Michelle's, with, um, in regards to Tanner Barton's case with Michelle, the case she's definitely trying to do basically almost the same thing you know trying to get the case reopened she's spreading um the message through social media spreading the facts getting the facts out there and that's pretty important you know you have to be the force the face and the voice for your loved ones especially when you knew them you know you have every right to question all those discrepancies all those things those trials and tribulations that you find wrong with these cases for sure, Sarah. Sarah, where can um, listeners find more information about uh, uh, what you have been doing and more about the, these two cases? Oh, thank you. Well, um, you can find me on my official website. It's www.sarahakshaw.com. Of course, um, you know, I'm on my social medias. You know, I have Twitter, I have Facebook, the whole nine yards. But my primary blog and website is Sarah's appshard.com the dubious death of a son and a mother's struggle for justice michelle barton and sarah afshar continue to fight to have tanner's case re-examined despite all the threats and disruptions i will leave you with sarah's own words on why she never gives up on her quest for justice. I feel like if you don't stand for something in life, you'll fall for anything. So giving up is as good as losing. Never give up on anything and always be vocal no matter what and never ever allow anyone to silence you or change your mind about anything, especially if you, you're confident in what you believe in. And also stick to your dreams and goals in life. Stick to the goal, not people or things. Thank you for joining us today. Make sure you subscribe to Even Salt Looks Like Sugar on YouTube or wherever you find fine podcasts. I am your host, Billy Hoosh, signing off. Until we meet again, remember, not everything in life is what it seems, because even salt looks like sugar.